everyone. Uh, I'm Scarlett. I'm the communications director and today's host. Welcome to the last webinar of Science Holics 2022 conference. We've heard um, from three amazing professors, but we have one more, which is Dr. Robin Haynes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Doctor. Well, of course. Thank you for inviting me. I love being here right now. Thank you. Um, before we begin, uh, let me give a brief introduction of what Science Holic is. We are a youth-run nonprofit that aims to introduce intricate scientific concepts in a manner that is fun and comprehensive to teens. We also offer various opportunities to students around the world, even to those who have English as their second language, to explore various fields of STEM with unique volunteer and leadership opportunities. Our main mission is to serve as a free resource for students of all ages to learn more about various STEM topics. And other than this webinar branch, we also publish seasonal magazine editions. We recently published our fifth. You can check it on the website later after this webinar. And we also host a bi-yearly review where we allow high schoolers to send in their research papers and have them professionally reviewed at a lower cost than most other publications. But you're not here to hear me rant about science holic you're here to listen to our guest speaker so dr haynes would you like to introduce yourself sure yes again thank you for inviting me i think this is wonderful what you're doing and i'm very honored to be asked to be a part of it but yes yeah, so introducing myself my name is robin haynes and i'm a research scientist at boston children's hospital in the department of pathology as you can see on the slide, I did my undergraduate degree in biochemistry at North Carolina State University and then my graduate degree in biochemistry at Wake Forest University School of Medicine. And currently, again, I work as a research scientist. I'm a principal research associate in the Department of Pathology at Children's Hospital. And I run a very small lab on um, it's sudden infant death syndrome. So it's, you know, a pediatric disease where infants sometimes will die suddenly and unexpectedly. And, and what I do in my lab is to try to get to that, get to the biological abnormalities that may put an infant at risk for dying. But I'm happy to be here. And like I said, I have in my little note, I love hanging out with my husband, my two kids and my two dogs. And I have a number of interests, but a couple are Stranger Things and Spartan Races. So that's a little bit about my personal life. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. But before we begin, attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to send them in the chat during and after the webinar. We'll try to uh, go over them at the end during the live Q&A session if they haven't already been answered. Now, without further ado, let us move on to the first question. Dr. Haynes, what is the focus of your academic and research career and what is unique about your field? Yeah, so um, I briefly mentioned that I, I study sudden infant death syndrome currently. When I went into pathology and, you know, and I, I have to say at the onset, I'm not a pathologist, I'm a biochemist. And so the pathology that I do in my research is not clinical. I cannot diagnose. I have no clinical affiliation with pathology, but I do pathological research. And I started to do that research on when I entered into my postdoc. It was really the first time I got into pathology. It was looking at brain injury in premature infants. And I started there and then I slowly transferred over to my current research, which is again on sudden infant death syndrome. And most of what I do is brain related, so brain injury, brain disease. Um, and, and I've kind of gone on that track for a long time, ever since my postdoc. Um, what is unique to pathology, I think is a really good question. And pathology is a wonderful field in that it's so incredibly diverse. You know, I work on brain pathology, but you can have liver pathology, you can have clinical pathology, you can do pathology in almost any area of human disease. And that's really what pathology is, it's study of human disease and human illness. And so I find it fascinating. And I think what I find, what I was drawn into pathology for is really the ability to work on human tissue. Because often, you know, a lot of research is done in animal models, cell culture, a number of different type of things and models, 
but pathology works with human tissue. And I think that's one of the most novel things about it and unique to pathology. And, you know, you can't study a human disease unless you start at the level of the human, human tissue, whether it be brain, liver, blood, whatever disease you're studying. So that I think is what's unique to pathology. And one of the things that really drew me into it and that I enjoy. And, you know, why children, why medicine for children, I think is another great question. I didn't necessarily go into my postdoc because it was a prop, a disorder of children. But when I went into it and I started to learn about it and I started to think about, you know, some of the connections I had, you know, with my children being young at the time when I started this and, you know, my, my interest in development, you know, that's one thing that's really cool about working with childhood developmental disorders is, you know, you're, you're placing what, what it is about the disease on top of their normal development. And that makes it challenging, but it also makes it really interesting. And so I think the pediatric, the children area in that sense, because it's, it's not just a straightforward question. You have to now look at where they are in their course of development and then what's abnormal beyond that. And that makes it really interesting to me. Uh, you mentioned that you can't diagnose people and you're not clinically certified. How does your research apply to, like, is there transition? What is the, the transition between your research to actual tangible um, changes in perhaps the clinic? Yeah, no, it's another great question. So, you know, with sudden infant death syndrome said, you know, we want to know what's, what's wrong with the baby. Why did they die of said What happened? And so our goal and, and the basic research is not clinical research so much, but it's basic research. Our goal is to identify, you know, abnormalities that they have that may have led them to, to die during sleep. But then how is it applicable? Well, once we know what those abnormalities are, then one of our ultimate goals is to be able to identify those abnormalities early on at birth or, you know, soon after birth, where you can say, okay, you know, this baby's at risk, you know, we're going to, we're going to get a, a biomarker is what they call it. We're going to get a biomarker at risk, and we're going to try to intervene before that happens. Or if there's a therapy, you know, if it's pointing in the direction of something that we can target in terms of pharmacological therapy, you know, we, we want to look for that. So that's how it's applicable. You know, you, you discover the abnormality and then you figure out ways to either prevent it, something from happening or to correct what the abnormality is. That's really cool. It's really important to identify the like, causes that might affect life and death early on so to prevent it. So I do think your research is really novel and important. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So uh, you do a lot of research, but you also teach. So what does your typical day look like and how do you manage your time between your different roles? Yeah, yeah. So the typical day, it, it depends in research in general. You know, I can tell you my day, then I can tell you research in general. It depends on the stage of career that you're in. So mm -hmm. at, at my stage, it's really a lot of writing. You know, I'm writing grants, I'm writing papers, I'm preparing seminars. You know, I, I do teach, but it's kind of, you know, not really part of my job. I do it because I like it. Um, but yeah, it's really at this point in my career, writing. That's the one thing I will say about academic research. You're, you're always writing something. You have to publish or you have to write grants to fund the research that you do, to fund your salary. And then, you know, interacting with people in your lab, you know, talking to them about their data, you know, you have lab meetings, you have individual meetings, really guiding their career is important, you know, mentoring and guiding the career of your postdocs or your grad students, your technicians, all of that is really important, at least in the academic setting. Um, and yeah, analyzing data. And that's the fun part. You know, when you get the data back and you start to look at it and start to, you know, put the pieces together and, and figure out what that data is telling you, that's fun. And then you take that and you put it in the publication or you figure out what the next step is and you take that and you use it to write a grant. 
Um, what do you think is the most rewarding part of your day then? Is there? Yeah, the most rewarding part is really when when you get that data and it actually gives you an answer to something. You know, I, I kind of think of research as detective work or, you know, puzzle, little pieces of the puzzle. And, you know, it's really rewarding when you get a piece of data that kind of fills in one piece of that puzzle and you're like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I get it. And now you can ask another question because, you know, it takes you in this direction and takes you in that direction. And so that is really rewarding. Or when you see people you work with, when they find that, you know, when they come up with something and, you know, and you can see that light bulb go off with them. That to me is the most rewarding part. Um, you know, and there, that doesn't happen all the time. You know, there's a lot of difficult times in research where you, you don't answer your question or you have this wonderful hypothesis that makes sense and it's completely wrong, you know, and, and that you just, you, you go with it and you just say, you learn from it, you know, now you know that that wasn't true. So you go in a different direction. So that, that to me is the part I love and, and really just interacting with the clinicians and the scientists around you, because if you get a good group of people, which, you know, I, I feel like I'm in a very good group of people of, you know, clinicians and other scientists, you're really feeding off of each other. You know, you're really listening to each other and you're all bringing different insights and different perspective and experience. And I think what you can learn collectively as a group is also extremely rewarding because things that you would never think about on your own, they're bringing to the table. I can imagine how many like extreme up and ups and downs there is in research, but I do believe like finding the end result, like the spark that kicks it off, it must be like really exciting to finally get what the results you want or just to discover something new. It is, exactly. I mean, you do you have to go through a lot to get there. And I think, you know, determination is probably one of the biggest things, you know, I could, I could recommend. You have to be a determined person because you, you have to go through a lot of negative results. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's that final one that works and that you get something interesting that, that keeps you going. Mm -hmm. Well, moving on. Uh, why did you choose your particular path in pathology? Did your plans change when you were in your college uh, years? And how did you finally decide on a specialty? Yeah, so it definitely changed. Um, I went from high school, all through high school, I think even junior high, I wanted to be a veterinarian. And, you know, I loved animals. I wanted to work with animals. I, you know, I worked in high school at a vet clinic. And then I got into undergrad and for whatever reason, I, you know, I think it was probably make a little bit of money and a little bit of credit. I took a, a role as assistant, a technician or something in a lab. And I found I really liked it. I really liked answering those questions and thinking about science and thinking about, you know, what I can do next and how I can best answer these questions. And I think at that point, I decided, you know, okay, maybe vet school's not for me. You know, maybe that's not the path I want to take. And I, you know, I was in biochemistry anyways, and I, you know, stayed in biochemistry and I started to do biochemical research. And then it just kind of went from there. And, you know, after undergrad, I decided I was going to keep going and, you know, you might as well keep going and research. And I got the PhD also in biochemistry. But how I decided on a specialty, I, I am doing, I don't do biochemistry at all at this point. So I really did kind of make a turn even after grad school and what I was gonna do. And that was based on, you know, I, I graduated, I always did basic, basic research, cell culture, no animal, but mainly cell culture. And I really kind of wanted, and, and you know, it wasn't a particular organ, it was more just cell cells. I really wanted to focus on the brain. I was had an interest in the brain, and I had an interest in, in working with human material. I'd never done it before. And so I looked for postdocs and I found one in neuroanatomy in the human brain and the human developing brain. 
And I'm like, well, you know, it's possibly not what I want to do for the rest of my life, but whatever, I'm going to go for a postdoc. I'm going to learn neuroanatomy and then I'm going to leave and I'm going to take that with me and do something else. And I got into the postdoc and I never left. You know, I just stayed in the lab. I stayed working in you know, the, the pediatric brain and I found I loved it. I found I really enjoyed what I did and I I like the pathology reason for all the things that you know we talked about before, and it was it was good. So I didn't leave, and and that's kind of where I am now with that pediatric pathology, still basic research. You know, it's not clinical research, but but based out of based on a very real human problem and on human tissue. I think you, from what I'm hearing, is that you tried something that you didn't think you enjoy and you stuck with it maybe so I well I knew I would enjoy it but I thought it maybe wasn't what I wanted to do uh, long term I just wanted to learn from it and then take that and do something else with it use it to learn about the brain and I did and I I really loved the lab that I was in and I loved my mentor in that lab and I think that's probably what kept me there long term as well you know if you get in with a good group and a good mentor who really takes the time to you know take care of you and teach you it's it's a pretty good situation and you know I have just enjoyed it enough where I wanted to stay and at this point you know my mentor for that many years retired and I took over the lab for her that's really nice to hear yeah. um, so uh, your research sounds really exciting, like your path, like the way you talk about it is so much passion. So if someone is interested in following your path, how can someone do so? Uh, what do you think they should study in university? What is What degrees they should have? And is there anything you wish someone had told you before you decided to follow this career path? Yeah, I mean, I think... And college really is when opportunities open up a lot for research. Um, although I, I think there are opportunities in high school as well. But, you know, once you're in college, if, if you know you love science, I, I think, you know, biochemistry for me was great because it really, it brought a lot of the, the classes that you will eventually take in a biological major. It brought it together in a really fascinating way. And it's not so specific that you know you kind of narrow in you can go very broad with that biochemistry degree which I did I went broad and I used that in you know neuroscience so I think a degree like that worked well for me um, and any opportunity you can find in college to, to get into a lab and to to figure out whether you like research it is not for everybody <laughs> You know, and I think many people go, or some people I know, have gone to get their PhD, and once they're in the graduate program, they realize, mm, you know, being in the lab is just not for me. So I think any opportunity you can figure that out early is, is a good thing. You know, take internships, take, you know, volunteer in labs if that's an option where you are. Anything you can do to get in, hold a pipette, you know, actually start answering these questions is good. Um, and is there anything I wish somebody would tell me? I think there's a lot of, when I went in, you know, you had two paths basically, or that's what they talked to you about. You know, there is the academic path and then there is the industry path. And you know, people talked about that and you kind of you tried to decide one way or the other which you want it to be, but there are, there are many paths that you can take. And I don't think you should lock yourself in unless you absolutely love research and you want to do research and then those are the two probably best ones. But if you love science and there's a lot of different options you can take, you know, other than academic research and industry research or pharmaceutical research. And so explore, explore other things, you know, there's a lot that you can do, explore them, think about it, you know, there's so many online resources now, you know, and, and maybe that wasn't there when I was thinking about it. But I also just, in terms of my own experience, you know, even though I kind of knew this was the case, you know, for somebody to say academic research is 
really rewarding and awesome, but can be really hard, you know, and, and I will say, you know, in the field of writing grants and writing papers, you kind of have to have a really thick skin because you will get rejected a lot. And, and that's a good thing. You know, you learn from those rejections and you move on and then you succeed, but you just kind of have to be prepared for that. And I think I knew it, but I don't know if you ever really know it until you're in it. Until you get that grant, you know, that they come back and they critique you and they critique your science and they critique everything about what you say. And it can be awesome, but it can be challenging too. So maybe, maybe just if somebody, if, if I would have, I would have done the same thing. I would still be on the same path, even if somebody had told me that, because I really do enjoy it, but it is not for everybody. <laughs> um, there's a question in the chat that I think is applicable to ask now. Uh, how do you overcome limits? I'm assuming challenges, such as laws or like grant funds to continue, continue your research. How do I overcome grant challenges and like any sort of challenges that come your way? As you mentioned, there's you get a lot of critique, and it, I'm assuming it must be discouraging sometimes too. Yeah, it, it is discouraging. Um, and yeah, you just one of the ways you overcome grant challenges is just again determination. Keep sending it in. You know, you take their feedback, you change it. You spend a day, you get sad for a day about it, but then you're like, okay, I'm gonna turn it around and I'm gonna redo it and put it out there again. And, you know, you just keep throwing things against the wall. And, you know, at some point you try enough, it's, it's gonna, something's gonna come back. But I mean, there are times where, you know, you are threatened with a lapse in funding and then you have to seek other areas or, you know, it's a numbers game, you know, in academic research and, you know, not in every place, some place you're doing teaching and that contributes to, you know, your salary. Where I am, it's almost 100% funding through grants. And so I really do have to go in, you know, every grant cycle. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it can be challenging. What was the other part of that question though? How do I overcome that? How do you come up? overcome just general challenges when it comes to research. I'm assuming that the majority of the challenge comes from grant funding and stuff, though. I mean, it, it's also, you know, publications just, you know, yeah, you publishing is sometimes hard, although, you know, by the time you're writing a paper, you, you know your data well, and it's really fun to put it together and put it out there. and you know, you will have challenges with reviewers and maybe they don't agree with what you say. And, and it's just, those are the things you just get used to. And you just know, know that you believe in your work and you believe what your work is good and valuable and is helping other people in some way. And you keep pushing through. And I think reviewers see that in time and it, it, yeah, it's just those things you come across and you just have to plow through. And in the end, it works out, you know, you'll you'll get a grant or you'll get paper published. It's just, it can be work to get there. And that's where that determination comes in at. Um, moving on to more general questions that might be a little bit more applicable to uh, our attendees who are mostly high schoolers. What advice would you give to high school students who are considering a career in STEM? Or since you do a lot of research, do you know of any um, ways that high school students can get research internships as well? Yeah, so I think, I mean, that is another great question. And I did a little bit of research to try to answer this because, you know, we we occasionally see a high school student in the labs where we are, but, you know, there it's not a huge number, but there were ways. I mean, there were groups and I can, I'm sure everybody could do this research as well, but I did find some legitimate STEM high school internships that you apply for. And I think it very much depends on where you're at. Like if you're in the Boston area, there's more opportunity with the hospitals there. Um, or if you've got, you know, academic institutions, universities around, you know, they're gonna be more opportunity there. 
so go go online look for these stem internships you know and and I, there, there are more options than I thought there would be out there. But the other thing, and this is kind of a broader net and probably a little harder in a way, is go, go to these academic universities, you know, Boston Children's or Harvard University or, or whatever university you have near you, or even hospital near you. Hospitals don't always do a lot of research, but go to them. And if you have a topic that you're interested, if you're interested in diabetes, or if you're interested in, you know, liver disease, whatever topic you think you might be interested in, Google, Google the research in your area where you live and find, find professors, find the principal investigator at the lab. And you, you, you know, it's kind of hard to do, but you can send them a blind email and just say, hi, you know, I am a high school student. I'm really interested in what you do. Is there any way I can get involved in your research? Um, paid, unpaid, it depends on the institution, what they require from that. I don't know. But, you know, if, if you have a sincere desire and not everybody's going to respond to you, you probably won't get everyone responding. And, you know, a lot of people won't have the ability to take in a high school student but some people will, and some people do. And it's usually the bigger labs that have a lot of postdocs and have a lot of other people, students, that they are willing to kind of mentor somebody, particularly in academic institutions, because that's part of teaching, you know, is to, to mentor and teach. And so bringing on a high school student just kind of falls into that general role of the institution. Is um, do you have more general advice in to students who simply just may not want to do research but want to go into STEM in the future? Yeah, I mean, really, just think about science. I mean, you're if if you're enjoying the, your biology class and you like thinking about it, and you know, obviously, if people coming to this clearly are interested in science just gauge your interest in it you know go out go go to the museum of science go to things and just see whether it's at all interesting to you to ask questions about your surrounding and to you know so ask questions about you know you know what whatever it is that you're you know going through at the time if you're interested in asking and answering those questions and figuring out kind of the world around you, you know, why is my skin the way it is? Or, you know, what's going on when, you know, I cut myself and it bleeds. If, if that's at all interesting to you, then it's worth exploring science and worth exploring really getting into. And, you know, use Google, use the internet. There's so many resources now you can you can explore science on many different levels, you know, read, read scientific papers. Some of them are going to be really challenging, but I think now there's probably a lot of resources for younger, younger students to really gauge whether you're interested in and just ask all those questions to figure out whether it's something you're truly interested in and then explore it, explore it in the ways we talked about. That's some really great advice. Um, I think it's time to move on to the live Q&A or an attendee's questions. Uh, we actually do have one attendee question submitted through our sign-up form, uh, which is, what scientific finding are you most proud of? Does this area of work and research have any personal importance to you? Yeah, so it, it does, I mean, it does have some personal importance. I did not go into sudden infant death syndrome because I had this personal thing with it. Um, but, you know, as I was starting in that research, I was having children and that just automatically puts you in a personal connection to in anything pediatric, anything surrounding your baby and, you know, your, your world at that point. So that's what really drew me in to said and the fact, you know, at the same time I was starting to research, you know, you, you're also meeting families that have, that have very personal connections with it and they draw you in. So really just meeting the people who are, 
personally affected by by my disorder of SIDS, but I'm sure you know anybody in science who's working on the disease would say the same thing. You know, you meet meet the people that are you know involved in it and have been affected by it. It's going to draw you in. Um, what scientific finding I'm most proud of? I would have to say that area that we talked about about the biomarker. You know, I made some findings as a postdoc on you know this potential biomarker for SEDS risk and it's something that I've been following up ever since on and it was probably the most novel thing in this field that I personally have moved forward and driven and that to me I'm probably the most proud of. Mm -hmm. It was something that that I moved forward not on my own you, you're never on your own but I moved it forward in the lab and and it must be like a really good, big achievement then. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun, it's fun. Um, I actually have a personal question. Mm -hmm. How has the pandemic affected your work, if it has at all? Yeah, so the pandemic was really hard at the beginning for everybody, everybody. But personally for me, because we were completely locked down, you know, at, at Children's Hospital, maybe a couple, one person out of the lab could go, but we were all at home and that was challenging enough. But, you know, at least in my field, you can, you could write. And so I was able to write at home. I wrote grants, I wrote papers, all the things that we talked about, but was super challenging if my kids were also home and they were remote learning. And the, the, the combination of the two, trying to work with them and do Zoom with them, that was a mess. But I think many people can say that same thing. In terms of my research personally, it didn't have, other than being home, I didn't lose animal models. I didn't lose cell culture. A lot of people did. You know, that's the benefit of what I do with the, the human tissue. You can put it in the freezer and it's fine. You're done. But a lot of people lost, you know, mouse models and other things that had to be actively maintained. They couldn't maintain it. Um, I think probably, you know, my fear when the pandemic hit was that funding was going to be even harder because obviously a lot of NIH money has gone to COVID for good reason. And I was worried that funding would be more difficult. And I don't know if that ever played out. Um, I, I don't think that was necessarily the case. But yeah. um, There's another question in the chat. Uh, how does your academic teaching intertwine with your research? Perhaps the person is asking about overlaps with the curriculum or material. Yeah, so again, um, T the teaching is just because I like it. It's really not a part of my research at all. It's not part of my job, but it, it, it doesn't intertwine well, actually. But, you know, it's funny. I teach about metabolism, which I love metabolism and metabolic pathways and, you know, all the things you get kind of in the later stages of biochemistry. And I try whenever I can to bring that knowledge into my, my research. And it hasn't completely intertwined yet um, because there is some metabolic aspects of SIDS, but not, not, entire, not, not the direction that the lab has been in. You know, the, we haven't done a lot of metabolics, but I try to bring it in where I can because it is really another interest of mine. And I teach it because I love it, but not necessarily because I do it in the lab. Um, just in, well, I, another personal question, actually. Uh, I'm sure research and teaching and balancing so many roles can be really stressful. So do you uh, have any advice about coping with stress and pressure? Yeah, you have to find other interests. <laughs> I mean, you really have to, I've, I've even tried to seek out additional hobbies to to kind of bring myself back down to earth and you know and I think if if you can find other ways to channel your energy when you need to it's helpful so go for a run go for a hike you know 
garden. That's my new hobby. I'm trying it out just to see if it calms me down and, you know, maybe it does. I don't know. But yeah, if you just have to be able to let it go and compartmentalize, you know, I've learned to compartmentalize my stress. You know, everything's on a deadline. So, you know, there are times where I'm focused on 10 deadlines until that one is approaching right now. Then I just have to zero in on that and compartmentalize that until it's done. But then you also have to move everything forward at one time. So, yeah, it really is, you know, whatever calms you down, whatever kind of keeps you grounded when you start reeling, which I can reel in my head when there's a lot going on, utilize, utilize those ways to keep you on the ground and, and calm and embrace them. <laughs> you know? Get on the treadmill, whatever you have to do, just yes. embrace it. Read a book, you know, that's not science. Read something fun. Watch TV. You know, watch a dumb show. It's a great you know, <laughs> I do think it's important to find hobbies that's not related to your like work or academic, like us being students, like completely separate, just to separate work and life to this. I personally find it a great way to release stress as well. Yeah, you need to. You need to. You can't think about you can't think about it all the time. It's not good. Um, seeing that there aren't many questions in the chat anymore, and I even though it's a little early, I think it is a good time to start wrapping up. Okay, great. And well, I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has them at a later stage, just email me. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to answer questions, you know, via email or whatever, whatever way you want. So, mm -hmm. um, so uh, attendees, these are all of Science Holic social media accounts. We have Instagram, WeChat, YouTube, where this recording will be posted later, uh, and LinkedIn and Discord, where we host uh, various um, discussions on on topics and get up uh, up to date updates about our um, activities and if you want to work with science holic uh, perhaps with me um, you can join as a team member uh, in one of our six teams as editing content outreach art social media website you can help with the webinars or with public publishing our magazines if you want a more low commitment way to help you can become an ambassador or if you wrote an article for your biology or chemistry class, you can submit it through our blog and magazine article submissions. Or if you have a research paper and you want a low cost way to have it reviewed, Science Holic Review is here. And, or if you just want to get some updates about future events like these, you can join our mailing list. Well, then that's the end of our two day 2022 conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Haynes, for talking to us. It was so great to hear from your perspective and your journey and your research for STEM. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining this conference. We really hope you enjoy it and uh, stay up to date uh, with Science Holic for our social media accounts to get more updates. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night. Thank, thank, you. thank you again. Bye -bye.